Here is what you missed this morning on the Catholic Morning Show. But right now, we have with us Jason Baxter, speaker, author, and college professor. He is the executive director of the Center for Beauty and Culture at Benedictine College in Kansas. He has a new translation of Dante's Inferno, and uh, he's a friend of mine, and I'm glad to get to talk to him again. Jason, how are you doing? Hi, doing well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. So, uh, Dante's Inferno, you know, just a, a walk in the park, right? Like something easy to do to decide to, to translate uh, Dante's Inferno. What, what prompted you, right, to undertake a, a journey probably as perilous as Dante's uh, to start translating this beloved uh, epochal work uh, in literature, world literature, but certainly for Catholic literature? Yeah, no, I felt like I had crawled through hell on my hands and knees while doing this. Um, <laughs> no, it was, it was it was a great experience, but I, 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 what drove me, I love Dante, and I think what drove me to want to be a translator was that I wanted to, I felt like almost like a kid sitting at the piano, mm. um, that I had played this song enough that I wanted to just to memorize it. And I wanted it no longer just to be sort of a sight read thing, but I wanted it to be in my heart and in my even even in my body, in my veins. I wanted it to be as close to the master as possible. And so I translated and uh, did the translation, sort of closed the eyes, put the book away, and um, and tried to play it on the piano and to get as close as you possibly could. And while I did it, discovered a lot of things which made me regard this this particular part of the poem of the of the comedy part one all the more. So, Jason, of course, uh, you know, there, we don't have hours and hours to, to break down, um, you know, exactly your, your method and what you chose to do. Certainly, there's there's many English translations of the Inferno and there's, uh, you know, theories and why you would do what you would do. But as I know you and your appreciation of, of poetry itself, um, what was your approach? Uh, and when people decide to buy your book as an, an introduction into uh, Dante's grand work, what what sort of approach did you have that um, here in 2024 is set apart from maybe some of the other quote unquote um, standard ones that maybe someone would see, like at a Barnes and Noble, for instance? Yes, I mean my my students and, and my friends who are reading it right now are saying that it's that um, it's exciting that they say this. They, they're saying that it's, it's difficult to put down. It's so it feels so intense. It feels so exciting, and that's fabulous because that's what I was going for. Because when Dante started to write it, everyone on his day expected a learned poem to be in the learned language. Okay, you want to write an encyclopedic journey from, from hell to heaven? That's fine, but you got to do it in the learned language. you got to do it in Latin. And there's all kinds of famous poems like Virgil's Aeneid, but then all kinds of really boring poems, which I won't even inflict on your listeners because I don't want them to fall asleep on their way to work, <laughs> that Dante also, had, uh, Dante also had in mind. And so when he chose to write this thing in Italian, it was quite a controversial choice. But he did it um, because he wanted it not just to be a head phenomenon, but a um, heart phenomenon, a poem which could be felt in, felt in the body. And he allows himself to use all these poetic techniques, which previously, just a few years before, he had told himself uh, in, a, in, a, in a writing called On Vernacular Eloquence that he would never use certain techniques. He would never use double Zs. He would never use double Xs. He would never use a pacing like this because he was trying to write the perfect poem. All of a sudden, he violates all those rules and creates this thing which I think in the, in the era of cinema we would call noir, right? It's a film noir kind of poem, at least the Inferno is, and it moves really, really fast. And some, I use some analogous poetic techniques for English to try to capture that. Now, the, the form that hopefully anyone who learned Italian or is a native Italian speaker and could see, the form stands out in a way that is sometimes lost in any translation just by virtue of taking a poetic uh, spirit from one language and putting it into the other. And so this big temptation, of course, right, when you're an academic and you're trying to translate is to be bookish about a poem. To hear your friends and family and the people who have read it getting to the sort of excitement, uh, the, the, the true way in which this is a, a via, a, a, a way, a, a, a trek through uh, the, the moral life, through the spiritual life, through reality itself, uh, that's already a great indication. But I do hope that people 
understand this about Dante is as much as sometimes people read Dante as like an, an, an encyclopedia on, on Catholic theology with a little bit of flowery language, it's quite the opposite. It's supposed to be compelling and grab us, uh, you know, in, in some ways in a pre-intellectual way so that when we come upon and dwell and contemplate on the deep thoughts that Dante has, it's actually our, our very human um, emotional life that he's captured first. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I, so I think um, one of the texts that Dante probably essentially had memorized was Boethius' Consolation of Philosophy. Mm -hmm. He came across it as a, fairly early in his life as a young man, and the way that they read in the Middle Ages, they didn't read as many books as we do, but when they read them, they read them again and again and again, and they had some sort of written into their, the code of the DNA of their life, and he knew Boethius super well. And there's a section of Boethius in which Boethius uses the old the old myth of Circe, who changed Odysseus's men into animals. And um, Dante sort of, I think, takes that idea and wonders that if his own Italy um, it would become incredibly fraudulent and propagandistic and divisive, uh, and <laughs> that reminds you of an election year. Um, <laughs> Dante, Dante worried that that his world had become so unhinged and unglued that they might not be able to hear the old beauties, and thus he had to he had to use a poem of power and weight. Right, he had to write beauties that burned like cold iron, says Lewis about Tolkien. Right, um, cut like cold iron and burned like fire, and that's I think yes, I think that's exactly part of the experience that Dante thought that, um, and in a world in a world of noise, as Flannery O'Connor once put it, you have to scream to be heard, and thus he came up with this this new style which forced attention. Hey, amen to that, and. I just want to thank you for this academic work, but I admire your ability to have your childlike faith, um, as you mentioned, a, a kid at the piano, and to be able to invite the Holy Spirit into understanding a work such as Dante's Inferno is, is fantastic. So this poetic spirit and translation that um, seeks, to be sought, uh, seeks to be had, uh, congratulations on this wonderful translation. And... Uh, again, it's just via your words, you are speaking from the heart and you are finding your childlike faith, bringing in the Holy Spirit to understand all the dynamics of this book. And so that is not a, a yeah, task well, easily done. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, there are all these um, wonderful writers in the 20th century, um, these philosophers of beauty like, like Gadamer and poets like Rilke, who wanted to try to reconnect the experience of beauty with also the sense of goodness mm. and they sort of they had they admired the ancient greeks for this for this ability to have um a holistic vision of life in which ethics and aesthetics right or the sort of questions of goodness as well as so the questions of of admiration and awe and wonder could be reconnected and, and i think that's dante obviously is probably the, the pinnacle of, of of that tradition so yeah, hopefully he was helping me on the whole project <laughs> well jason you know you sound like maybe you should be an executive director of i don't know a center of beauty and culture and lo and behold uh, that's what you're doing at benedictine college in kansas so could you maybe relate how uh teaching dante and, and th this sort of work uh is a, is a perfect match for what you're now doing uh down in atchison kansas well, thanks for asking. Yeah, I think if, if you think of a center, you almost think of like a scientific lab, right? And I've sort of taken that um, that metaphor for thinking about beauty in this way. What if you what if you studied beauty in all of its different phenomena, all of its different forms, right? What if you took natural beauty, artistic beauty, but also beauty in terms of paint and beauty in terms of poetry, but also beauty in terms of lives, like, like the ancients did, and you try to put all those things back together, and you wanted to know how they all interrelated. Um, I think that's that's what we're doing here, and we do it for the students. We have experiences of beauty for the um, for the students, but I think I think what's you know we could, I think it's easy to get discouraged in our age, but um, our students 
even in this bleak world, maybe because of this bleak world, incredibly hungry and incredibly spiritually thirsty, and they have they have a heart for this. Maybe like you know, better trained students in the past might not have, right? Because they haven't been they haven't been saturated on these things, and thus they respond very warmly. And they themselves want to have this holistic view of life. They're tired of just knowing things. They want to be things, right? They don't want to just see beauty. They want to eat beauty, and they want to metabolize it and have it become part of their beings. And that's what that's what the center is for. Not just to promote a certain understanding, but also to promote a certain lived experience in which we we habituate those things and get them into our daily lives. We have classes on that sort of thing at Benedictine College, but we also have also have experiences of going to the symphony, having speakers, but um, yeah, trying to incorporate pieces of the liturgy and uh, the habit of reading a lyric poem once a day. We do we do teach the students how to do those types of things as well. Well, Jason, this has been fantastic to catch back up with you over the airwaves. If people want to find out more either about your new translation of Dante's Inferno or uh, the Center for Beauty and Culture at Benedictine College, can you let the folks know where they can go find out more? Yes. Um, we uh, The book is available on Angelico Press. Um, and Angelico Press, you can find it on massive behemoth uh, delivery systems as well. Um, but I also have a website, jasonmbaxter.com, jasonmbaxter.com. If, if people want to look at it, I can also um, sign and mail a copy if, if that gets readers excited to be connected with the author in a small way. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Jason Baxter. As I said, new translation of Dante's Inferno and executive director of the Center for Beauty and Culture at Benedictine College in Kansas. Jason, thank you for joining the morning show. Thanks so much, guys. Listen to the Catholic Morning Show weekday mornings at 7 on the Iowa Catholic Radio Network, iowacatholicradio.com, or the Iowa Catholic Radio app.